Hey guys, welcome back to Jessen Reads Romance. I'm Jessen and today I'm doing a very fun video. Now, like most of the romance community who really loves paranormal urban fantasy romance, the Immortals After Dark series is very prominent and it's something that I haven't read until this past year. I actually started reading them in 2021, 2020 and then I finished them off in 2021. It took me a little while. I kind of felt like the pressure because it was such a beloved series, but at the end of 2021, I decided I needed a refresher because Monroe was announced. Monroe has been put off for so long because I'm sure that Cressley Cole had some, you know, life stuff that she was dealing with and we have to give authors some grace whenever they need to take a break from writing and handle whatever they need to handle. But now Monroe has been announced and it's coming out at the end of this month. I think it's the 20th. 5th and I'm so freaking excited. Some of my friends have arcs. I don't think that I'm going to be requesting very many arcs this year. I'm really hoping that it's going to be amazing. So I thought since I did my reread of The Immortals After Dark towards the end of 2021, I kind of binged them in November and December and I had such a great time. I actually liked them better the second time around. Like I was just like, oh my god, these are so great. I listened to them on audio. The audio is fantastic and I thought it would be fun to rank them because I know that there's some really beloved books of the series that I heard so much about before I started my journey and I look forward to them and I'm wondering if anybody would be surprised by my ranking. So I'm going to start from the top with my most favorite book of the series. That has got to be Sweet Ruin. I love Sweet Ruin so friggin' much, okay? Joe is a standout heroine to me in this series. I really loved her. Of course, there's going to be slight spoilers during this ranking because I'm going to talk about characters, what they're going through. Um, so if you've never read Immortals After Dark series, then it might be slight spoilers. But Jo, she's such a fun character from the moment that I read her first chapter as a little girl who was in charge of her toddler brother. She was an orphan and she wanted to handle everything by herself. There was a nice lady who worked at the library who really wanted to take him in, but she was just like, nope, it's just me and Thad. I have the Thad pack and he has his Spidey doll and I am enough. I am what he needs and I can handle all of it. Well, Joe also wants to be a superhero and she decides to kind of become a little vigilante child. She is a child and she gets caught up with the wrong bad guys who kill her. So she dies, but she's an immortal and she didn't know it. So she comes back to life. She's like, this is great for superheroes, but it also scares Thaddy. And Thaddy was taken in by the woman who worked at the library and they're gonna adopt him. So Thaddy doesn't react well to ghost Joe and she decides to keep her distance. And we see her as she's growing up, she doesn't really know what she is. So she's not a character that knows very much about the lore, even though she is an immortal, which I think creates a very interesting situation. And then we have Rune, who is like thousands of years old. This dude is a fuck boy. <laughs> He's a dark face, so his uh, bodily fluids are poison. They're toxic. He's part of the Morior, and we know that Nyx has foretold like, like the Morior coming and it might bring about the end of the world. So we're not sure what to think about these new people. And all we know is that Rune has been tasked to kill Nyx by Orion. I love the way that Josephine, Joe, keeps Rune on his toes because he seems a little bit jaded, but Joe is something new and fresh and stands up to him. And she is a foul mouthed badass who just absolutely decimates all of these walls that he's erected around himself because he's almost shunned by, you know, Lord and society. Society. Anyway, I just really freaking loved this book and I love this couple so much. So they're my top favorite. They're my top favorite. And this is one of the latest books in the series. Like what year is this published? 2015, which I know it seems like a long time ago, but there was only like one more book published after this. So anyway, love them to death and they are my top favorite. Next, I have Dark Sky. I absolutely could not wait. Once Sabine and Lanthe were introduced, I knew that Thronos was her hero. It was so obvious, but the Reckoners and the Sorcerer are enemies. The Reckoners want to capture Sorcerer, take their power, put them on the path of good. So Reckoners are kind of like demon angels, but they don't want to acknowledge that they have any like demon ancestry and they're on the path of good. And I love this contrast because they're so opposites attract. Thronos has grown up in this very sheltered, prudish society. And Lanthe's a sorcerer and they thrive off of sensual, sexual things. They dress very risque, they worship gold. 
and I knew that this was going to be such a fantastic romance knowing that they knew each other as kids and there was such a tragedy that broke that trust and shattered that friendship when Lanthe's family, their, their hideout is betrayed and Thronos' father comes to their fortress and kills them. Sabine's life was in danger and Lanthe used her powers of persuasion to help her sister, heal her sister. In the process, she also tells Thronos to jump out the window and not use his wings. So now he is battered and broken. His wings don't work properly and he's always in pain. And I love the way that these two are thrown together. I love all the scenes of Panamonia. It is just, it is chef's kiss. Also, one of my favorite scenes is when they're in, um, I forgot his name already, but the sea god's territory. That scene was just really great. I just loved it so much. Oh, I love this couple. Then we have McCreeve. This is my top three. I love the Lyke in this series, but McCreeve is such a standout to me because this guy has been through the ringer. He was abused as a child and it really shattered his family. And then after all that, he was on Torture Island and he's having like severe PTSD from being vivisected. His heroine is a daughter of the director who orchestrated everything that was happening on Torture Island. I love the scene where he first realizes that Chloe is his mate. He knows that this is the daughter of the enemy, but once he has her sent and knows that this is his mate and Monroe, his twin brother, is like, oh my gosh, I smell her too. She smells like my sister. This is your mate. Oh my gosh, it's the human. And she's in danger and we have to save her. And so he has a split second decision. Do I save the daughter of the man who tortured me and, and directed other people to torture me? Do I hold that against her? Or do I accept this once in a lifetime chance to have a mate because he's been waiting for hundreds of years to find her. They've lived through so much and she's right there in his grasp and he decides to take it and he's like, she's mine. And I love, they have such a wonderful couple of days where Chloe has been being introduced into the lore because she had no idea. She's keeping a secret that she is a Lorian. She just doesn't know what kind of Lorian her mother was. Her father kept that a secret from her. And when that secret comes out, it has a direct tie into his previous abuse and his PTSD as a child. And even though he acts like an asshole, his pain and the reason why he reacts that way is so understandable. It's I hurt for every person in this situation. Monroe, his twin brother, is phenomenal during this time because you don't wanna force someone to just be like, get over, get over all the things that happened to you that traumatized you. But you also don't want his feelings about the situation to hurt the woman that he loves and promise to protect. And all of a sudden he's become this different man because of this revelation. And it's just so good. And I love the way that it played out. I love the way that it played out. Also, there's an epilogue in here that um, teases what's going to happen with, with Monroe. So you have to read this one before you read Monroe. My number four is Dark Needs a Night's Edge. I love Conrad and Naomi so much. So this is a ghost romance. Naomi is a ballerina, former ballerina who lived in New Orleans and she was murdered by her lover. And so now she's tied to this house, this old stately house, and she haunts it. And the Roth brothers are vampires. One of their brothers, Conrad, has drank the blood of so many others. So the memories of other people are overwhelming him and driving him insane. His brothers are forbearers, so they forbear and they don't drink the blood of other living creatures so that they don't become mad and they're trying to save their brother, do everything. So they trap him in this house, hoping to get him you know, off the high of blood, hoping that there's something they can do to bring his mind back to make him sane again. And what's so interesting is that nobody can see Naomi. And when she, she's very put out that somebody is in her house, like these men who are all bloody and crazy and breaking things. But then she notices that Conrad, this crazy person tied to her bed, um, can see her. And it is fantastic. I love their romance because his brothers think that he's crazy. Like he's like, he's seeing people. This is the voices in his head, but no, he's seeing this ghost. I love the room, it's so much. It is, it is a standout, it's such an interesting concept. And I don't normally gravitate towards ghost romances, but this is one of my favorites of all time, like ghost romances. It's just really, really, really great. And I love Conrad and I love the way that he's committed to Naomi. And I just love the second chance that they get with each other. It's beautiful. It just always stands out in my mind when I think about the series, Mortals After Dark. I'm like, that book with Naomi and Conrad was just 
awesome. Then I have Wicked Deeds on a Winter's Night. This is Bowen and Mariketa, and this is during like the Amazing Race segment of the series. I love how Bowen is on a mission to get this prize at the end of this race in the hopes that he can bring back his mate who died and he feels like it was his fault. So this is his second chance he could bring her back and hopefully have a life with her. Well, during the Amazing Race, he plays a little dirty and traps Mariketta and her group of people, which actually includes two demons who also get a book, Cade and Rydstrom, traps them and um, Caro. Is Caro there? I can't remember. I know that I reread <laughs> <laughs> this series only like two months ago, but uh, there's just a lot of characters to keep track of. But anyway, he traps them in this cave system and Marquetta is supposed to be this extremely powerful witch. She has the potential for so much power. She's called Marquetta the Awaited, but she doesn't really have a good grasp on control when it comes to her power. So she can't, he expects that eventually Marquetta will be able to get them out of this cave and she can't. So they're stuck with these like demon things, like starving, and she's not quite into her immortality or she's very newly into her mortality. So it's not like she can just survive without nourishment. And I really love, again, like the Lyke because they are so single-mindedly in pursuit of their one true mate. They want, they want them so freaking bad, but they always end up by acting like a little bit of a dummy and I enjoy that about the like case. So Bowen's like so dumb about it sometimes. He's so single-mindedly obsessed with the woman that he thinks was his mate that he kind of wants to ignore the feelings that he's having towards Mariketta. And there's no way that Mariketta can be my mate. I've already discovered who she was and she died. So I just really love it. Um, the stuff that happens toward the end was like so heart pounding and Oh, so good, it was so good. So I love Bowen and, and Mari. Speaking of demons trapped in caves, I love Kiss of a Demon King. Rydstrom, <laughs> he has lost his kingdom and it's kind of his brother's fault in a way. And we find out more about that in Cade's book, his, his brother, but Rydstrom is obsessed with getting his kingdom back. And his heroine, Sabine, his fated mate, the only one that he can have children with because it's a very interesting thing with demons. They can attempt a bunch of females, but they can't actually complete the deed unless they find their mate. His mate just so happens to be Sabine, a sorcerer, and her half brother, Omort the Deathless, is the one who has overtaken Rydstrom's kingdom. And his kingdom is just awful and disgusting and depraved. It's just, it's truly awful. So Sabine and her sister, Lanthe, who are half siblings with Omort, they're under his thumb. They're both poisoned, and they have to have their little antidote every once in a while, and that's how Omar keeps them under his thumb. He knows that Sabine is Rydstrom's mate and is jealous because Omar is disgusting, and he also is sleeping with another half-sister. So he wants Sabine to seduce Rydstrom, they capture him. Sabine is the queen of illusions, and she weaves this illusion to lure him into this dungeon, and basically she sexually tortures him, hoping that he will be so overcome with lust for her, his mate, and attempt her and get her pregnant because that's what her brother wants for his reasons. And in the process, he has been conditioned to be this really stand-up guy with honor and he holds to that with his teeth. He does not want to be taken in by Sabine. He knows that this is not the type of woman that he ever imagined his queen to be, so he resists very hard. And I just really enjoy the way that Sabine kind of exploits this hidden part of Rydstrom that he tamps down, this very like aggressive, needy, little bit kinky part of his persona that he just hides away from. And of course, Sabine being the seductress that she is, brings it out and it's beautiful. And Sabine's actually a virgin sorcerer, which is almost unheard of because they're so sensual. And when the tables are turned, it's delicious. And I just really love Sabine, who has been fighting for her sister Lanthe for so long, wanting to just have a family and belong. And I love the way that their pairing is so unexpected and they're really beautiful together. Then I have A Hunger Like No Other. This is the technically first book in the series. Um, there is a novella, A Warlord Wants Forever. 
but this is kind of like book one of the series. Our first Lyke pairing and Lachlan has been missing. He, he's the king of the Lyke and Lachlan McCreeve has been missing for a couple hundred years. He's emaciated and he is weakened because he's been chained for so long in the clutches of these vampires. But one night he smells his mate and he chops off his own hand to get to her, to get out of his manacles. Smelling his mate is the thing that finally pushes him over the edge and allows him to maim himself in order for him to escape. And the thing about it is his mate is Emma. She's half Valkyrie, half vampire. And she feels like she doesn't fit in. So she's kind of like gone on walkabout. She, she doesn't want to be under the thumb of her Valkyrie aunt who always give her a hard time for being a vampire. And she's very worried about that part of herself. She doesn't want to be somebody who drinks the blood of others. It's very taboo. Vampires and their drinking of blood, taking of the memories of others there's is very, very taboo in the lore. So Lachlan finds Emma, who's also very sheltered, and she is just like, it feels like a captor captive romance in the beginning. It does. He comes on so strong because he's been so deprived for so long. He doesn't even know how much he's scaring her, how much his need scares her, and it leads to some very questionable scenes, but it doesn't bother me. They are questionable, but I still really love their romance and I really love the way that Emma comes into her own. She has to deal with this situation, this crazy situation. She has to deal with it. And in the process, learn a lot more about herself and her strengths and just be a lot more comfortable in her own skin. And I love the way that Bowen really lifts her up and is the catalyst for her gaining that confidence. And she becomes a fucking badass queen. And she's like double middle finger to all my aunts who doubted me. And I'm like, yes, Emma, yes, you get it. So Emma's and Emma's fantastic. And I love the McCrees. I love all the McCree werewolves. Next, I have Dark Desires After Dusk. I really like Cade's book. I feel like I don't really see a lot of people really loving Cade and his romance with Holly, but I really do. So Cade is Rydstrom's brother, the one that Rydstrom has blamed for losing his kingdom. But there's a rumor that Groot the Metallurgist has made this sword to be able to kill Omart finally. And all Cade and Rydstrom need to do is deliver this vessel, this vessel to Groot in order for this prophecy. During the accession, there's like a vessel and depending on who impregnates the vessel, they could be vessels for good or vessels for evil, this child. So I love how Cade, he's kind of like a little fuck boy. Like I said, demons have to like attempt a lot of females just to discover, hey, are you my mate? Let's have sex and find out. And Holly is human and Cade knows that he'll never be able to be with a human. So he just kind of like watches her from afar. And then when he hears the rumors about the bad guys going after the vessel, he discovers that it's Holly. Holly is part Valkyrie and she didn't even know it. She's immortal and she had no idea that she was part of the lore. But once she's captured before Cade rescues her, she finally starts coming into her own power. I love how Valkyries have that affinity for lightning. It's very, very cool. And Cade is like, okay, well, I rescued you. Let's go on a mission. Let me teach you about the lore. And I really love this dilemma that Cade has. This is his mate, his one true love, the only person who he could ever be happy with and have kids with. And his task is to hand Holly over to the enemy. And he's struggling with it the whole time because there is this sense of duty that he has to Rydstrom. He feels very badly about how his actions, even though they were beyond his control once you find out exactly what happened, his actions have really impacted his relationship with his brother. And so it's like loyalty to my brother and loyalty to my mate. And it's such a dilemma. It's such a dilemma. I love the way that it plays out though. And I, again, I love the way that Holly comes into her own. She becomes such a badass. She rescues herself and it's just, it's just really great. And I love it so much. It was really kind of an impossible situation and I love the way that it played out. I really, really enjoyed this one. So all the books have been five stars so far. Yeah, all the, all, all the books have been five stars so far. Nothing less than a five. Next, I have Pleasures of a Dark Prince, another McCree like a. This is Gareth. And I really like how, <laughs> I really love how Lachlan and Bowen's struggle with convincing their mate to be with them 
has influenced the way that Gareth deals with Lucia when he finds out that this is his mate. So Lucia is a very interesting Valkyrie. She actually left heaven because she was seduced as a, a young girl by this god. And once you leave heaven, you can never return. And every few years she has to return. Like she, she escaped, she escaped her husband, this god who's foul and disgusting. Every few years he wakes up and he could bring about the end of the world. So she has to basically like kill him in order to put him back in the slumber. And it's just like a vicious cycle that she has to deal with every single year. And she hasn't really told anybody else besides her sister, Katerin. When Gareth meets Lucia and she's the archer. So anytime she shoots her bow and arrow, she's been gifted by this goddess, this ability to be a phenomenal archer. If she misses her target, Target, she feels physical pain and it, it's devastating. So she's really great at what she does. When Gareth meets her, he knows that he has to tread cautiously and he knows that she's probably gonna spook easily. So when she point blank asks, like, am I your mate? He's like, no, no. <laughs> so they're on this amazing race, okay? She's on a mission and Gareth continually has to follow her and try to protect her and all the while, while he's pretending that this is just kind of like sexual attraction and it's nothing more. And I just really love their romance. I Again, it's something about the Lyke and their possessiveness that they feel, the protectiveness that they feel for their heroines. And I just really love how all in that they are and they really will do anything to protect them. And I think that Gareth is just so freaking adorable. I just love him so much. Then there's Dreams of a Dark Warrior, which I don't actually have the paperback for this one. But Dreams of a Dark Warrior, actually kind of surprised me in my reread because I remember liking Dreams of Dark Warrior, but when I reread it, I was like, no, I really love this actually. And I know a lot of people are offended because the hero was involved in the torture of his heroine. So this is the Torture Island segment of the story of the series. And Declan Chase is actually a reincarnate and he doesn't even know it. In this iteration of his reincarnation, because originally he was Aiden and his wife, is Regan, the Radiant. She's so beautiful and they meet when she's very, very young actually. And once they're finally together, you know, hundreds of years ago, once they're finally together, he tragically is killed. He vows to come back for her in the next life and find her again and to seek Valhalla so that he'll become immortal. And so he's been re reincarnated over the years and every single time, like Regan's like, I don't want to be near his reincarnate because as soon as we find each other, as soon as we have sex, he dies. And I can't go through that again. It, it hurts me so badly. Well, Declan Chase is the um, modern day reincarnate of Aiden. He has no memories. He has no idea that he's a berserker. He thinks that he's human and he's actually working for the guys on Torture Island who capture Lorians and experiment on them because he believes he's in a war against good and evil and that all the Lorians are evil and they need to study them in order to make weapons against them. He doesn't know why he feels this affinity towards Regan and Regan doesn't really wanna tell him because again, she's afraid. If he remembers all this stuff, he's gonna to wanna to claim her and she just, cannot let him die. And I really love this situation where he doesn't have memories, his, he doesn't have his old memories back. Regan doesn't wanna to be tortured, so she has a choice. Like, do I let him on that, yes, I'm familiar to you, do you wanna know why? Like, I, I knew you, you are a reincarnate, you're a berserker, you're not human, and you're torturing your own kind, basically, but doesn't wanna tell him, like, I'm your mate. Like. <laughs> we were married and you're basically the love of my life. So there is a situation where Regan is tortured. She is vivisected and it's very horrible for her. And earlier, Declan himself actually gives her like this poison that's very painful. And a lot of people are offended that the hero has tortured the heroine, but I just, he, he's brainwashed at this point. He's brainwashed, he's doing what he was groomed to do by the director and I don't hold it against him because he does everything in his power after he discovers who he is, what he is, how he's been misled to right his wrongs. And I just really love that redemption for Declan. So I very much enjoyed this book and it was still a five star read for me. Then we have Demon from the Dark. Now this is Malcolm and Caro. So Malcolm is a demon. And he was a very lower class demon. He actually was supposed to protect his best friend 
And when it, when this guy experimented on them and mixed their, their demon blood with vampire blood, he's this hybrid and he doesn't, he holds out as long as he can. He does not want to give in to this thirst, this temptation. He ends up by killing his best friend who was a prince. And so now he's a pariah and he's just living out in the wilderness in this demon realm. Okay. He is primitive. He's almost like a caveman hero. He's been alone for so long. Then we have Caro and Caro is on Torture Island and Declan Chase is actually tasking her to go in to this demon realm and go capture Malcolm because they want a vampire demon hybrid to experiment on. Okay. And Caro is his fated mate. She's a very powerful witch and the way that the guys on Torture Island control all the Lorians is they have this torque on them so that they can't really use their powers. And what Declan holds over Caro's head is that he will spare her adopted daughter if she does this for him. So she feels very protective over her adopted daughter and so she knows she has to do this. But the more she gets to know Malcolm, realizing that this is, you know, I'm his mate, she struggles with betraying him. She's trying to figure out a way that she doesn't have to hand over Malcolm, but also can save her adopted daughter. And she doesn't know how to communicate this with Malcolm. So I really love this because there's a communication barrier in the beginning and it's really kind of cute. And Malcolm is just so primitive, but adorable at the same time. And I just really love them as a couple. I feel like I forgot about Malcolm after the first time that I read the series and then I read it again. I'm like, oh, my sweet baby angel. <laughs> I remember you and you were so adorable. So I really love this one as well. Then I have No Rest for the Wicked, another Roth brother, this time it's Sebastian Roth and his mate, his bride. And I don't, I didn't really talk about this, but the vampires, they know that they have met their fated mate, their bride, when their heart starts to beat, they come alive again and are able to experience pleasure again once they find their bride. Well, his bride is Katerin, and Katerin's in the amazing race because she wants the same thing that Bowen wants, that, that idol that'll allow her to go back in time to save her sisters. So she had sisters that were killed in a vampire attack, so she's always had such a hard on for killing vampires, and guess what? She's the bride of a vampire, which is, She's like, no, 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 I do not accept. <laughs> so Sebastian has to convince Katerin that he is different and he's not like the vampires who she so hates. He doesn't know about her sisters, doesn't know her motivation to wanting to get into this race. And I just really love how Sebastian just needs to be near her. He needs to be near her even though she does everything that she can to get away from him and wants to protect her during this race. Like he doesn't even care about this race at all. The only reason why he's there is because he recognizes her as his bride. So he's going to protect her the best to the best of his ability. And sometimes that means that he takes the brunt of some pretty brutal things in order to protect her. And I just love it because she's so adamant that she can't be with a vampire yet he's winning her over. And I, I love that. Classic like enemies where, and I love when the hero is hell bent on making the heroine his no matter what. It just gives me all the feels and a lot of the books have that kind of trope in it where the hero is the one that recognizes like, I will do anything, anything to be with her, anything to convince her that this is fated, that we belong together. And so I really love that Sebastian pursues her to the very bitter end. So great, so great. All right, now we're getting to my four stars. Now I have Wicked Abyss and I did really like this book. I'm wondering if the audio was a little bit of a reason why I didn't enjoy it as much. So I remember when I finally read Wicked Abyss for the first time, I was like, I couldn't help but laugh at some of the dialogue in this book, especially when Abyssian, who is another Morior, just like Rune from my very favorite book in the series, when he feels pleasure, he screams in ecstasy a lot. And it's just so... <laughs> much. It's so much. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I don't really blame Robert Petkoff because the dialogue, when you actually read it, I mean, he, he's screaming a lot anyway. So Abyssian had an older brother who was kind of cursed. When you're the king of Pandemonia, this demon realm, you are cursed to be this like beastly being 
who is horned and hooved and just looks like something from out of your nightmare. And Abyssian didn't always look like this, not until his brother died and he became the successor to Pandemonia. So he was always this very, very good looking guy. And now all of a sudden he has to rule Pandemonia, which he never really wanted. And he looks like that. He was betrayed centuries ago by his fae bride, his mate, and betrayed by her. Well, she has been reincarnated. Lila is a fae princess, and she is betrothed to her cousin. She wants to be queen. She she wants to be accepted in the fae realm. She knows that she would be a good ruler, and since her parents kind of had like an uprising against Seth, or I think that's what his name is, she's been banished to the mortal realm, and I love how she kind of made it on her own by hiding out in Disney World, and she became a Disney princess. Like, she's a real life fae princess, and she disguises herself, dresses up as Disney princesses, and I thought it was really fun. So Sabine and Lanthe show up on the scene, and they've struck a deal with Seth. Since Lanthe and Thronos have a kingdom in Pandemonia for the Reckoners, they want their territory to basically be left alone. So they deliver Lila to Abyssian as kind of like a peace offering. Like, here you go, Here, here's your here's your fated mate, the one who betrayed you all those years ago, and um, do whatever you want. And make sure that you leave our kingdom alone, we want an expansion, yada, yada, yada. So they make a deal, and Lila is now the prisoner of Abyssian in this castle. Very Beauty and the Beast, Hades and Persephone vibes. Again, I really enjoyed them as a couple. There was just, it wasn't quite as compelling as previous books in the series. And sometimes I was a little bit frustrated with Lila, especially when she wouldn't open up to Abyssian. I wish that there was a little bit more openness between them as a couple, but it all works out in the end, like it always does. And I kind of really love how in the end, something that Abyssian really hated about himself, his beastly nature, he, at the end he has an opportunity to be beautiful again, and Lila's just like, that's not the man that I know. Like, I actually like your demon form. And he's like, really? And it's just so great. And it's just so beautiful. I love, I love that she accepts him just like he is and appreciates this immense powerful demon and doesn't need like the pretty boy. I just thought that was really cute. I also really love how she claims her right as queen of Pandemonia and owns that bitch. It was awesome. Then I have Lothair. This was one of the books that everybody said, oh my gosh, I can't wait till you get to Lothair. And I don't know if it was because it was so hyped, but I don't feel that way, especially upon my reread. It was very hyped for me in the beginning. And I was just expecting something so amazing with an anti-hero, somebody who was, oh, he's, he's evil. You know, he's evil. Just like Bowen, he wants his bride. He thinks his bride is the goddess who's currently possessing this human woman, Elizabeth who is a country hick. She lives in the middle of nowhere, her family are extremely poor, and he's just like, no way is she my fated mate, so I know that it's the goddess of like this death goddess. Um, yeah, that sounds like a worthy mate to me, not a human. So he's so convinced that the goddess is his and not Elizabeth. The goddess, is really not interested in Lothair. So let's Elizabeth really deal with Lothair. She just wants him to find a way to expel Elizabeth from this body so that she can take hold of it. And then she basically kind of makes a promise, like I'll help you claim your, claim your kingdom. And he knows that if he has this goddess on his arm, somebody who the vampires worship and respect, that his claim to his kingdom will be solidified. And so that's, it's like a dual thing. Like no, he wants his bride, but he also wants his kingdom so bad. And I don't know, I just didn't really feel the evilness from Lothair. And I kind of was really annoyed with him for a lot of it, for being so obtuse, even though I understood where he was coming from and how he kind of wanted vengeance for his mom. And that was a lot of his drive. But I don't know, I just didn't get as much enjoyment out of their relationship as I did from other couples in the series. And Lothair does <laughs> this big thing where he like cuts out his heart. Um, and I thought it was kind of funny, but I i don't know. I heard a lot about, oh my God, he does this thing. He sends her something that's so freaking amazing. I think it was a lot to do with hype and I just don't 
feel the same about Lothair. He, he wasn't my bad boy turned good that I really was expecting. He kind of fell a little bit flat for me. And I feel bad for saying that. It's not that I don't like his book. I gave it four stars, but I just don't feel the same as a lot of people do. Then I have The Warlord Wants Forever, which is the prequel novella with N Mist and Nikolai Roth, the first Roth brother that we meet. And this is kind of really short. Um, <laughs> Nikolai knows that Mist is his bride, obviously, for obvious reasons. And again, being with vampires is so taboo. And so she gets a lot of hell from her Valkyrie sisters at being the bride of this vampire. And so she's been running away from him for years, basically sexually torturing him because he can't fulfill himself. But he single-mindedly pursues her. And yeah, it was a good novella. It wasn't like, again, didn't have the oomph that the other pairings do, but it was fine. So I gave that one four stars. Okay, I have Untouchable on the list. And this is one that I didn't reread because I didn't want to. Another novella, I think she wrote this um, in an anthology with Gina Showalter and maybe another person. And I just really didn't care about Daniela and Murdoch Roth. Like, I don't know. I just was, I remember being so bored the first time that I read this that I was like, I'm just going to skip it during my reread. So I have vague recollections of certain scenes, but again, I didn't reread this and I didn't really care for it. So I gave that book 3.5 stars, but then we get to books that I read for the first time this go around. I didn't read the Dacian books the first time that I binged the series. And when I was rereading it, I was like, I should read the Dacian books because we have that coming into play in some of the later books, like the Dacians are in the background. There's something in Dark Sky. It's kind of tied into one of the Dacian books. So out of the two Dacian books that are out, I liked Shadow's Seduction better, which is Caspion and Merceo. Now we meet Caspion in Shadow's Claim. And he, I didn't have good vibes from Caspian and Shadow's claim. So I wasn't super excited that he was going to be the hero to Merceo, who is a Dacian kind of vampire. Again, we had the whole fated mate things going on. Caspian has never been with men before. And they start off as actually really good friends. And Merceo is doing everything he can to seduce Caspian and show him, hey, you're my fated mate. <laughs> And the thing about the Dacians is they have the secret kingdom. Caspian was invited by Merceo to go there and he breaks the rules and actually leaves. So Trahan, that's like the main plot point of Shadow's Claim. Trahan is a cousin who basically tracks down all of those who could betray the Dacian secret and he needs to kill Caspian. Anyway, so the book with Caspian and Merceo, it was fine. It doesn't have the same like feel and vibe of Immortals After Dark. It feels kind of like very side questy and it wasn't my favorite. Definitely these are the lowest rated books that I have with the series. They're between three and 3.5. I can never really decide because I don't, I don't hate it, but I also, when you compare it to the rest of the books, it's like, man, they're just not, they're just not it. They're just not it. So they're, their relationship was fine. Caspian just kind of like a broody little broodster. Merceo is fine too. Anyway, but Shadow's Claim is probably my least favorite. And it's not because I hated it. I just don't like Bettina's character. <laughs> and I know that I've seen on some Facebook groups they are like, we think Bettina gets too much hate. And I'm like, but she's annoying. She's annoying. She's obsessed with Caspian, who is her best friend. And she's convinced that they need to be together. And when Trahan comes to kill Caspian, he ends up in the room of Bettina and Bettina is kind of a little bit drunk and she thinks that this is Caspian and like kisses him and stuff and turns his world upside down. Bettina is half um, demon, half sorcerer eye. And she's also the person who makes all of Sabine's weapons, her stylish weapons. I really love that tie in, I really do. Like Bettina could have been such a great character. I just hated her obsession with Caspian. Seriously, I hated it. And the way that there was a misunderstanding towards the end where Trehan's like, you're always gonna choose him. And she's like, but he's my best friend. I'm like, yeah, but you could have made that clear. Like I choose him as a friend. I don't want him hurt, but I don't feel the same way anymore. I just thought it was too much of author's hand in making a third act conflict. And I just didn't really love it. And again, like I said, the way that she was obsessed with Caspian who never thought of her as anything other than a sister, even though he made it very clear. He's like, I'm not interested in you like that. Um, watch me go fuck all these other people. And she was just like, if only 
he was with me. Maybe he changed his mind. And I was like, get over yourself. Get over yourself. So I just couldn't like Bettina. And I felt very bad for Trayon because he was um, pretty consistent. Once he found her, once he knew that this is the woman for me, entered himself into the tournament to claim her hand in marriage because that's the plot of the book. It's kind of like gladiator tournament for her hand and also control of her demon kingdom. <sighs> and yeah, he deserved better, I think. I think he deserved better. Still Bettina, but maybe a Bettina that wasn't so obsessed with Caspian, a fuck boy. Okay, so that's it. That's my ranking. We shall see once Monroe's out where he falls, where his book falls in my ranking. And rankings can sometimes be fluid. I think my top five are pretty solid. Monroe could sneak into the top five though because I loved him so much in McCreeve, but I'm pretty sure my top five are pretty solidly my top five. That doesn't mean that the ones that are ranked below it were any less beloved because like I said, most of the books in the series are five stars for me. But I just thought that this would be really fun, a really fun thing to do since I decided to reread them in the lead up to Monroe. Again, I recently kind of came into Immortals After Dark series so I didn't have as many like years of rereads as a lot of people who lo really love the series and that's why I wanted to do a reread. Uh, there were so many prophecies, so many interconnections that I needed that refresher. I'm crossing my fingers that Cressley Cole is back on her writing game and able to commit to a more consistent writing schedule if her personal life allows it because I really, there's lots of things that are teased and I'd love to see those fulfilled. There's just, this, this series doesn't have an end in sight, you know? There's a lot, a lot going on that has still not been wrapped up. So I'm very excited for Monroe. Let me know what you, what are your top fives? If you love Immortals After Dark, what are your top fives? And do you really disagree with the way that I ranked mine? If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe to get notified on any future videos that I do. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, life's better with a little HEA. Bye guys.